hi everyone, I'm Dr. Peter Teixeira and I'd like to thank AJR for the opportunity to comment on our recent publication about the evaluation of the dorsal subluxation of the scaphoid in patients with scaphoid ligament tears and using a 4D CT to evaluate uh, that. So as you all know, scaphoid dorsal subluxation is an important factor in scaphoid lunate instability as it increases compressive and shear stress on the lateral and dorsal aspects of the scaphoid fossa. Uh, this is a, a, something that is evaluated commonly both on imaging and perioperatively, and you can clearly understand the impact of that on degenerative joint disease in the moving wrist. As you can see, the uh, dorsally subluxed scaphoid impinging against the dorsal rim of the radius there. Uh, usually this is evaluated on conventional radiographs, but in our uh, practice this was um, uh, hindered uh, by superimpositional issues and by the fact that for an accurate evaluation of dorsal subluxation you need a perfect, perfect profile view of the wrist and this was uh, sometimes hard to uh, obtain in our, in our practice. When we started looking at dorsal uh, subluxation of the scaphoid dynamically, there were some unexpected findings. You can see in this example that when the wrist uh, it was in a neutral position, we can clearly see a dorsal displacement of the scaphoid. But when we asked the same patient to clench uh, the fist, uh, this subluxation was reduced, which was uh, sort of um, unexpected. And then we wondered if there was any uh, dynamic behavior to dorsal uh, scaphoid subluxation, which was um, uh, poorly described in the literature. The other thing is that we uh, had a question whether the amplitude of dorsal subluxation had an importance uh, on uh, the evaluation of the scaphoid uh, dorsal subluxation and we thought to evaluate also that parameter. So measuring the posterior subluxation of the scaphoid can be accomplished by calculating the posterior radial scaphoid angle uh, and uh, to do that uh, a sagittal image that is located one centimeter from the ulnar border of the distal uh, radius is selected. That's a red line on image A. Uh, and then on that image, two uh, markers are, are placed to construct a line, marker one and two in the volar and dorsal portions of the articular surface of the distal radius. And then the sagittal uh, images are browsed in order to locate point four on image C, which is the uh, posterior um, uh, most point of the uh, scaphoid. So another line, uh, the three, four line is constructed and the angle created by these two lines is, uh, corresponds to the posterior radio scaphoid angle. And this angle uh, corresponds uh, and correlates to the uh, dorsal displacement of the uh, scaphoid. So uh, obviously uh, we described that on CT. Uh, and uh, this article was all performed on CT measurements. And then, uh, but in our practice, uh, since the same landmarks are, can be detected and seen on MRI, uh, the same measurement can be performed. And then this is slide, I show you an example of this. And this is the same patient that had been evaluated on MRI and on Arthro CT. And then you can see these, uh, the PRSA angle uh, that was uh, measured uh, showing about the same two degrees difference uh, in there, but as you can see, a, a similar evaluation can be performed on um, MRI, even though uh, the uh, results of that article are all based on uh, dynamic CT studies. So our data indicates that the PRSA progressively increases with the uh, severity of the tears of the scaphoid lunate ligament. Uh, you can, we also show that in some patients, uh, this uh, um, angle could be altered in the absence of scaphoid diastasis before diastasis was detectable on uh, conventional radiographs or CT. So uh, posterior radial scaphoid angle, normal values with the wrist, wrist in the neutral position was uh, 100, uh, it's supposed to be uh, below 103 degrees. So this could be used as a reference value. And then there was a positional variation during the radial ulnar deviation of the wrist on that angle of about 10%. 
So this should be uh, considered if you're uh, evaluating the risk in the different uh, positions. So if we look at this table uh, in the bottom of the slide, you can see a progressive increase uh, in uh, PRSA values uh, from the control group, uh, from patients with uh, partial tears and full tears without diastasis and in patients with diastasis uh, going up to a mean of uh, 107 degrees in patients with diastasis uh, and a mean of uh, 98 to 99 degrees uh, in the uh, normal patients. And it's uh, interesting to compare these values with our prior publication on uh, the posterior radio scaphoid angle. Um, uh, that showed that in patients with uh, slack wrist, uh, degenerative joint disease of the wrist uh, associated with scaphoid instability, uh, usually uh, the um, PRSA values were over 114 degrees, showing a sort of a progression of the increase of this angle uh, with the severity of uh, um, scaphoid and instability, which was uh, our um, main uh, finding of this study. So based on this data, we believe that the posterior radio scaphoid angle should be measured whenever uh, sectional imaging methods are used in the uh, image workup of patients with suspected scaphoid and instability, particularly CT, and the values uh, of this angle increase with the severity of the scaphoid ligament lesions, and this should obviously be considered in the evaluation of these patients. All these conclusions could uh, be reached by looking at values uh, obtained with the wrist in the uh, neutral position. So there is no actual need to perform dynamic imaging to evaluate the posterior radio scaphoid angle. So uh, that were, these were the main conclusions of this article, and uh, I thank you very much for your attention.